A hundred years ago, on the 2nd of January 1905, Michael Tippett was born in London into a family that one couldn't describe as musical. It's difficult for us, with music of all kinds permanently available at the touch of a button, to appreciate just how little music there was in Tippett's early life. No radio, no records, and with the family having moved to Suffolk a long way from concerts in London. Tippett's teenage years coincided with the First World War. Music lessons were considered too frivolous a pursuit then. So, as he was growing up, apart from singing in the church choir and hearing his mother singing drawing-room ballads, Tippett really had very little contact with music. At the age of 14, he was taken by his English teacher at Stamford School in Lincolnshire to his first orchestral concert in Leicester, conducted by Sir Malcolm Sargent. The programme included Ravel's Mother Goose Suite, and Tippett said that as he sat listening to that music, he decided there and then that he would be a composer. A song called simply Music by Tippett, setting the poem by Shelley and revealing a hint of his lifelong enthusiasm for the music of Henry Purcell. Despite his parents' anxieties about him entering on such a precarious career, and though he had no formal qualifications, in 1923 Tippett managed to get a place at the Royal College of Music, as he explains himself. My parents, who lived abroad then, they were in a train somewhere, and uh, they met up with a man who was in fact a doctor of music, and said, oh, well, there's such a thing called Royal College of Music, and this is where you could send your son to. Mercifully, they didn't have, at that time, any entrance examinations whatsoever, and I couldn't have passed one. I was a, a greenhorn. I mean, I, nobody could go to Royal College of Music in the state now, and, and by the luck of it, I was sent to do the, the composition to Charles Wood. He had been taught by Stanford, and Stanford had been taught in Leipzig, and he'd been taught exactly as Wagner was taught. And so you got a German training of very great strength. It had nothing to do with English school at all, as far as I could understand. I had to find that for myself. At the Royal College of Music, Tippett also had piano and singing lessons, and he studied conducting with Malcolm Sargent and Adrian Bolt. Every Friday, the senior orchestra rehearsed. It was only rehearsed by Bolt. He was only about 35. And I asked him whether I, he'd mind my standing beside him to look at the scores. And for four years, I never missed a Friday. And in the end, about after two years, he said, look, I think Michael, or whatever he called me, he said, you better come and stand inside. So I stood inside with him. I was known as Bolt's darling because I'd resist, oh, I thought it was so funny. But I learnt an incredible amount because I heard, I don't know what I didn't hear, train by Bolt. He was not Bolt's darling, however, when it came to the premiere of his own Second Symphony in 1958, which broke down two-thirds of the way through the first movement after the horns had come in too early. In his autobiography, Tippett opines that older generation conductors such as Sargent and Bolt really weren't in sympathy with his music due to the fact that, among other things, they had little, if any, knowledge of the pre-classical music which lay behind many of his ideas, and they didn't get the classical references either. During the rehearsals for Tippett's Second Symphony, Bolt moaned to him, I don't understand this modern music, to which Tippett had said, There's hardly anything here you wouldn't find in Brahms. Well, from our perspective, as you'll hear in this performance of the symphony, it's difficult to appreciate now what Bolt was making such a fuss about. There's nothing here to frighten the horses. The symphony's stuffed with good tunes. Tippett isolated the starting point for the work as being on a visit to a radio station in Italy, listening to some tapes of Vivaldi. Some pounding cellos and bass seas, he said, suddenly threw me from Vivaldi's world to my own. <laughs> 
After the debacle of the Premier, Tippett was dismissed as clumsy and undisciplined, and of using too many notes in his muddy scores. It took a new generation of conductors and performers to show how wrong that judgment was. Tippett admitted to having dreamed of working in the theatre from a very early age, and it can only be the cumulative power of those years of dreaming which impelled him to act in a way which seems completely out of character with the strong moral and social principles of the mature man. In 1926, during the general strike, there was a shortage of extras to fill out large choruses at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. These parts were apparently normally taken, amazingly enough, by grenadier guardsmen but they had more urgent roles to fulfil in real life during the strike. Students were invited to strike break, stepping in to replace the missing guardsmen. Tippett found this chance simply irresistible, and he and some of his friends had the thrill of appearing in a production of Wagner's The Master Singers, conducted by Bruno Walter, with Lottie Lehmann in the cast. Tippett observed everything around him with rapt fascination, filing it all away for the future. More in line with the tippet we think we know, he wrote his first opera for a work camp in Yorkshire in 1934, a ballad opera version of the Robin Hood legend. On hiking tours of the north, Tippett had seen for himself the effects of the depression, mass unemployment and starving children. His comfortable middle-class existence now seemed untenable, and he threw himself into organising music in the work camps, driven by the conviction that, as he put it, somewhere music could have a connection to the compassion that was so deep in my own heart. His efforts to establish this connection through opera began with a version of the Beggar's Opera, before he composed one of his own. Robin Hood, along with two operas he composed for children, both collaborations with Christopher Fry, remains unpublished, but Tibbet's five later operas are absolutely central to his work. From each one, themes and ideas flow into other works of his. We'll hear now from his first published opera, A Midsummer Marriage, three of the ritual dances, in which three male animals are symbolically chased by three female animals. The earth in autumn, the hound chases the hare, the waters in winter, the otter chases the fish, and the air in spring, the hawk chases the bird. As with his second symphony, The Midsummer Marriage had a tricky start. One critic wrote after the premiere that this was one of the worst in the 350-year history of opera. And indeed, for the first 20 years of its existence, the criticisms levelled at it were similar to those of the symphony, that it was undisciplined, overblown, and yes, with too many notes. However, as with several of Tippett's works, it just needed time, and when it was recorded in 1971 and then staged by Welsh National Opera in 1976, it was recognised for the masterpiece it is. <laughs> ¶¶ 
wishing to live by music alone, I went into adult education musical work and one of my first jobs was conducting an orchestra of unemployed professionals. This orchestra was one attempt to help deal with the social problems of the great slump. Back in the late 20s and early 30s, when the mania for the cinema first took off and talkies came in, the death knell rang for the pit bands of the silent era. As theatre owners recognised that that was where profits lay, variety theatres and some West End theatres laid off their resident musicians, swelling the growing tide of unemployment. After his experience of bringing music to the work camps in Yorkshire, Michael Tippett had been taken on by Morley College in South London to direct a weekly class that would help unemployed professionals to keep their hands in. Working with the string player Dan Franks, Tippett decided to convert the class into the South London Orchestra. Beginning in the autumn term of 1932, they had a two-hour rehearsal once a week, working towards a concert in the spring. Their concerts were a great success, so much so that on a couple of occasions the orchestra took on engagements playing at outside events. The repertoire was fairly conservative, but on a few occasions Tippett managed to sneak in one of his own works, and so it was the South London Orchestra which gave the premieres of a number of his pieces, including the Concerto for Double String Orchestra. Despite the sheer joyousness, exuberance and jazziness of this score, the music was slow to win admirers, difficult as it is to understand that now. In terms of structure, the concerto reflects Tippett's lifelong admiration for Beethoven's musical architecture. In fact, the middle slow movement is modelled on the slow movement of one of Beethoven's string quartets, the one in F minor, Op. 95, where a song-like tune from a solo violin is elaborated into a fugue and then comes back again, sung this time by the cello. The song, in this case, reflects another Tippett enthusiasm for folk music. It's one of the traditional tunes for the Robert Burns lyric, Car the Yows to the Nows. During the afternoon of the 7th of September, 1940, German bombers appeared in the skies over London. The Blitz had begun. A month later, bombs destroyed Morley College almost completely, with the loss of 57 lives. With nowhere to rehearse anymore, the South London Orchestra had to disband, but the college itself was determined to continue in some form. The evacuations of children precipitated by the Blitz meant that they lost their then Director of Music, he also taught at Westminster School, which was moved to safety out of London. Tibbet was asked to take over what was already an illustrious tradition. I now became director of music at Morley, a job made famous by a revered predecessor, Gustav Holst. Curiously enough, the largest room left to us in the college buildings is in fact the Holst Memorial Music Room. Many people all over the world know of Morley College, if they could see the odd little place it is in fact, they'd be surprised to find it in one of the shabbiest districts of London. It's really an evening school in the humanities for people after their work. There are lots of such evening schools in London, but Morley College has special renown for one reason and another, particularly the music department. There our aim is to admit at the bottom of the unlettered amateur, voice or recorder or what you will, and so to arrange the training that we blossom out at the top with concerts entirely uncommercial which do something particular and positive for London musical life. The teachers there were paid next to nothing. It's a labour of love. Michael Tippett. He brought to the task before him at Morley College a great deal of love, skill, energy 
and charm, so that by the end of the war the choir of eight voices he had begun with had grown to over seventy, though in wartime conditions, however charming he might be, it was always going to be a tough call to attract large numbers of male singers. This was no ego trip for Tippett. He got on with the hard slog of administration, happily delegating a lot of the other work, and only reserved conducting the choir for himself. One of the people to join Tippett's Morley College choir was the composer Anthony Hopkins. I arrived at Morley and instantly fell under Michael Tippett's spell. He was technically a very poor conductor, but musically a totally inspirational one. There was no technique. I mean, he literally sometimes would start us off by sort of flinging himself towards and saying, all right, go. <laughs> but there was something about the spirit that he brought into the music. We were introduced to music, which in those days was completely unknown. I mean, nowadays you get everything on CD. But we were doing a lot of early English music, Purcell, Gibbons, Wilkes, and Monteverdi. And we were suddenly introduced to these passionate, wonderful madrigals and were totally infatuated with the music itself. We would go out into the dark and into the whole feeling of war as though we'd literally taken a lightning trip to Italy and, and a different world entirely. There was this young group of string players who ultimately became the Amadeus Quartet, people like Norbert, Martin Lovett, Shidloff, Susie Rocher, who married Martin Lovett and who once faced with an anthem called My Beloved Spake, said to me, Tony, what is a spake, please? <laughs> the composer and future presenter of the wonderful Talking About Music programmes on this network and later Radio 4, Anthony Hopkins. Some of the music Tippett composed around this time was written with the college choir in mind. Here are two songs he wrote for them in 1943. The Wind Hover is a setting of the famous poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, reflecting in his highly idiosyncratic language the poet's wonderment at the dazzling flight of a falcon. The other song, The Source, was published as a contrasting pair to The Wind Hover. It sets lines by Edward Thomas, a young poet who died in action on Easter Day 1917 in the First World War. It was in the process of searching for a tenor precisely to sing in that performance of Orlando Gibbon's anthem My Beloved Spake that Anthony Hopkins spake about that Tippett first met Peter Piers and Benjamin Britten. They'd only recently returned from their long wartime stay in America. The three of them quickly became close friends. They had a lot in common, including their pacifist sympathies and an enthusiasm for the music of Purcell and Monteverdi. It was out of that shared musical passion that Tippett's song cycle Boyhood's End developed and Britain and Piers gave the first performance at Morley in the summer of 1943. Piers of Britain also influenced Tippett in his composition of another work and were the first to perform The Heart's Assurance in May 1951. The song cycle was composed in memory of the one woman Tippett had ever contemplated marrying, Francesca Allenson. She was an accomplished musician, a choral conductor, like Tippett himself, and a researcher into folk song. Tippett found he could confide in her openly and completely about his life. He says in his autobiography that early on in their relationship they discussed marriage and children, which I wanted as much as she did. What he doesn't say is that this marriage discussion was precipitated by the end of a homosexual relationship on his side. Later, they talked about the possibility of her having children through artificial insemination. In fact, they both had, as he put it, homosexual sides to their natures, but she appeared to have more affairs of one kind or another with the opposite sex, and the plans for a closer, long-term relationship between them, more deeply hoped for on her side, I think, 
came to nothing. One of the major obstacles, quite apart from the sexual ones, was that Tippett's obsession with composition kept getting in the way. Francesca suffered many years of debilitating illness with goiter, which had progressively worn her down. She was half Jewish, and as the war continued, with more and more horrifying reports emerging from Germany and the areas it had invaded, she was agonized and depressed by what the Nazis were doing to the Jews. All of this combined in a pernicious way to make her feel that her life wasn't worth living any more, and she killed herself early in 1945. Tibbet was urged on by Peter Piers, who commissioned the Heart's Assurance, to work on the cycle of songs in Francesca's memory. He took time off from writing the first act of his opera, The Midsummer Marriage, to compose the first two songs, but an attack of hepatitis forced him to delay completion of the cycle until he'd finished the opera's second act. It was by this time 1951, and Tippett then felt that the intense mixture of emotions he'd felt immediately after Francesca's suicide, grief compounded with guilt and remorse, had been transmuted into more generalized feelings. This was why he later said that the underlying theme of the cycle was love under the shadow of death. There's no narrative line to the cycle. Instead, it's a series of reflections on that theme. The first poem Tippett sets is called simply Song. It's by Alan Lewis, as the majority of the poems in the cycle are, a young poet killed in the war, as was Sidney Keyes, who wrote the words of the following song, which gives the cycle its title, The Heart's Assurance. Never, 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 never trust the heart's assurance. Trust only the heart's fear. And what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, go back, go back. In 1943, Michael Tippett was sent down to Wormwood Scrubs Prison for failing to observe the conditions of exemption imposed on him as a conscientious objector. To get the record quite straight, I was granted exemption if I did certain things. That is to say, if I did not teach what I taught in Molly College but taught it in an air raid shelter to air raid wardens, I would be exempt. This seemed to me so absolutely idiotic that I refused, point blank. And I said, no, I'm afraid not, I can't. This is absolutely to give it all away. I was given a three-month sentence inside for two months. I, therefore, I had an in incredibly light time, though it was a deeply moving experience, because I think you've got to face up to the fact that if you are a conscious objector in a time of war, of your country at war, then you are excluded from the assembly of your countrymen in a particular manner. Michael Tippett himself in the early 70s. Here he is again more than a decade earlier. I went to prison after I wrote The Child of Our Time, which is about a man going to prison. That is a sort of paradigm of something that is going to happen. And when I got there, I felt I was at home because I had been so close to the outcast. turns on its dark side. It is winter. The opening movement of Sir Michael Tippett's oratorio, A Child of Our Time, 
Sensing that the state of the world was likely to become very much darker, and to remain so for a long time, Tippett began to compose the music of A Child of Our Time on the 4th of September, 1939, the day after war was declared. He had already completed the series of short, simple texts he intended to set. Tippett himself said that A Child of Our Time arose out of the general situation in Europe before the Second World War but a Europe, for me, stretching out through its torments towards Russia in the East and even America in the West. So that though after much searching the final jolt into composition came from a particular and political event, I knew, Tippett said, from the first, that the work itself had to be anonymous and general in order to reach down to the deeper levels of our common humanity. The particular event which provided that jolt was the action of a 17-year-old Polish boy. On the 7th of November, 1938, brooding over the news that his parents had been deported to Poland by the Gestapo, young Herschel Grinspan shot a diplomat at the German embassy in Paris. When Hitler heard about the assassination, he and Goebbels decided atonement was necessary. This took the form of Kristallnacht, or the November pogrom. In Vienna, in the space of 24 hours, synagogues were destroyed, Jewish-owned shops were looted and closed down, and six and a half thousand Jews were arrested, more than half of them sent to Dachau concentration camp. These are the events reflected, in a generalised way, in the central section of A Child of Our Time, focusing at the beginning of part two on the figure of the scapegoat, the child of our time, with the narrator's resonant line, and a time came when in the continual persecution one race stood for all. And a time came when in the continual persecution one race stood for all. The oratorio wasn't just about the Nazis' persecution of the Jews. It was intended and was understood to stand for all oppressed peoples. By the spring of 1944 came the first performance of A Child of Our Time, an oratorio whose story and message is distilled from the unforgettable and I fear ever-continuing story of present-day persecution. I wrote the words myself and preface them with a short quotation from the contemporary poet I most value. The darkness declares the glory of light. That, I think, precisely describes the oratorio. It goes down into the darkness that it may sense just how light is glorified from there. For though I'm myself a pacifist, a child of our time isn't a personal confession of faith at all but springs from a much commoner and wider and deeper need. It seems to speak to all kinds of people and all over Europe. Just before he started to write the text for A Child of Our Time, Tibbet undertook a course in Jungian analysis, concerned mainly with the interpretation of his dreams. Among the discoveries he made was a crucial realisation for him that each individual psyche is made up of both shadow and light. It's therefore futile for us to seek to project shadows onto someone else, either individually or at the level of nations, maintaining that they are all shadow and we are all light. What we have to do is to examine the darker sides of our personal or national identity, reconcile ourselves to it, and therefore become complete as human beings. This idea became hugely important to Tippett and lies behind a lot of what he was trying to express in his operas. It finds transparent expression right at the end of A Child of Our Time in the ensemble passage, I would know my shadow and my light. Mm -hmm. 
Back in 1935, Tippett was one of some 100,000 people who responded to a newspaper appeal by the Reverend Dick Shepherd to anyone opposed to war to send him a postcard. Out of this evolved the Peace Pledge Union, of which Tippett would later become president. When Tippett's call-up papers inevitably arrived, he went through the laid-down procedure, applying for an exemption on grounds of conscience. This was followed by his being summoned to appear before a tribunal and present his case. This he duly did in 1942, but it was rejected. He appealed, but was again assigned to full-time duties with either the Air Raids Precautions Organisation or the National Fire Service, or working on the land. All his friends advised him to compromise, but Tippett wasn't for taking the easy way out when he saw others, less privileged than himself, being sent to prison. He was sentenced to three months in Wormwood Scrubs, but qualified for a month's remission for good behaviour. Whilst inside, Tippett was put in charge of a prison orchestra and also had the treat of a visiting performance by Benjamin Britten and Peter Pears, at which he was invited onto the platform, strictly against the normal rules, on the pretext that someone was needed to turn the pages. After his release, Britten and Pears entertained him to breakfast, and in the afternoon there was an emotional reunion with his friends at a celebratory performance of his second quartet at the Wigmore Hall. Tippett himself saw his first three quartets as quite distinct from the later two. The second he considered the most classically balanced and closest to the traditional four-movement model. But as you'd expect by now of Tippett, he doesn't just take the standard pattern off the peg, he juggles with it. The first movement is a lyrical allegro, and it's followed by a slower, very intense movement. The scherzo which follows feels propelled by some unstoppable force. It's one of his exercises in unconventional rhythmic patterns. The finale, he said, was an attempt to shift the dramatics from the first movement to the last, as opposed to lightening everything at the end with some sort of rondo. You're listening to the podcast version of BBC Radio 3's Composer of the Week with Donald MacLeod. Corsham is only eight miles from Bath, and soon after he settled there in 1960, Michael Tippett was invited to sit on the Council of Management of the Bath Festival. At the time, Yehudi Menuhin was the artistic director, and his drive and enthusiasm helped to establish the Bath Festival's reputation as an artistic and social highlight of the musical world's calendar. Menuhin included some of Tippett's works in his festival orchestra programmes and transformed the fortunes of one piece in particular. In Tippett's words, when Yehudi's band played My Fantasia on a theme of Corelli, everyone fell for the piece. This hadn't been the case at its premiere at the Edinburgh Festival, at which the BBC Symphony Orchestra was to have been conducted by Sir Malcolm Sargent. However, after Sargent had publicly rubbished the piece before it had even been heard, Tippett decided to step in and conduct the performance himself. Despite the best endeavours of all involved, the piece wasn't a great success. This is another of those cases where it's very difficult to appreciate from our perspective what the problem with this music might have been for those who took against it on first hearing. As you'll hear, it's a gloriously lyrical and luxuriant score. The piece was commissioned to mark the 300th anniversary of the birth of the violin virtuoso and composer Arcangelo Corelli, and so Tippett takes two little samples of Corelli, one slow and one fast, both from his Concerto Grosso No. 2 in F. Tippett saw these passages as dark and passionate on the one hand, and brilliant and lively on the other. He begins by introducing his two themes in a series of contrasted variations, and then moves on to pit the light elements against the dark. (laughs) 
This is followed by a fugue which builds to a frankly erotic climax before relaxing into a pastoral conclusion. I said earlier that it was Yehudi Menuhin's energy and commitment which had really established the international credentials of the Bath Festival. Unfortunately, his ambitions grew and took an operatic bent. He became very enthusiastic about conducting opera, almost always a ruinously expensive business. And so it proved. In 1968, a year after an act of great personal generosity in giving £3,000 to save the festival opera, Menuhin left on not entirely harmonious terms. There was a remaining deficit of some £12,000, and for the following festival, Tippett was asked to take over as part of a three-man directorship, along with the conductor, Colin Davis, and the artist's agent, Jack Phipps. These kind of partnerships very rarely work, and this one didn't, and in the end Tippett was asked to run it alone, which he did in 1970. The practicality and hard-headedness of Tippett's approach, which was thoroughly businesslike, may have come as a bit of surprise to some. He set his sights on eliminating the deficit, and to that end cut out what he saw as the dead wood on the council, the aristocratic types who enjoyed the kudos of being involved in this arty set-up, but didn't do much other than turn up for long, leisurely lunches in stately homes. In their place he introduced commerce, people from the business world who knew about money and budgets. Tibbet kept the backbone of the festival largely as it had been, with a programme of choral, orchestral and chamber concerts, given in buildings in and around Bath. But he expanded it to Bristol, establishing the Colston Hall as a venue for the large-scale symphonic and choral repertoire, which couldn't be accommodated in Bath itself. As you'd expect of a man with Tippett's credentials, he also set out to democratise the festival, which up to that time had a rather stuffy black tie image. At the first press conference he gave, Tippett said he didn't mind if people turned up in jeans. In an attempt to reach wider, younger audiences, he also experimented with rock concerts, and for two years there was a blues festival. But the logistical and organisational challenges for the small Bath team proved to be more than they could cope with. Another of Tippett's innovations was what he called the Director's Choice Concert. The Director's Choice concert is quite interesting. I was interested in, in newer music and fresher ideas, young people's music and so forth, but it is very difficult for one small festival to make a total contribution to this huge problem of new music. And as I didn't want to put down artificial reasons for it, I decided that the easiest thing would be to have at least one concert, and that this concert would mean that there would be no question why I was choosing it, except that it was individual. I did, at the early part, give it over to composer colleagues of my own generation who I felt it had a raw deal. Also, I'm very keen that young performers should have a chance, without being in the full glamour of a huge concert, but have recitals of their own in smaller halls in Bath. But we make a condition. Within their recital, which they choose themselves, they must have at least one piece which is off the beaten track. And this has proved immensely effective. And we've had a really good audience of all ages, from young to old, for these particular concerts. In 1973, the 29-year-old Paul Crossley gave the world premiere of Tippett's third piano sonata at the Bath Festival and overnight achieved international recognition. Though Tippett composed the piece in three movements, fast, slow, fast, it's designed to be played in a single unbroken span. <laughs> 
During his span as artistic director at Bath, which he set as a five-year tenure so as to avoid the danger of the programme in getting into a rut, Tippett invited to the festival a group he'd been very much involved with in the 60s. In 1964, already widely known to have an interest in musical education, he was asked to be patron and director of the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra. They may not really have imagined that Tippett, the famous composer much in demand, would be actively involved in their music-making, but if that's the case, they didn't know their man. Despite all the other demands on his time, Tippett threw himself into this new role with gusto, and in his first year he composed some music specially for them, which would eventually become the last two movements of his Shire Suite. The Leicestershire authorities went out of their way to accommodate Tippett's demanding schedule. On two occasions, over the Easter holidays, the orchestra was billeted out at secondary schools in Corsham so that he could keep up his routine of composing in the morning and then rehearse with them in the afternoons. Tippett made it a condition of taking on the job that he should work with the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra almost exclusively on 20th century music, and of course they also had the privilege of working with him on performances of his own music. In one of their earliest concerts together, at the de Montfort Hall in Leicester, he conducted a performance of A Child of Our Time with massed school choirs. Meanwhile, he was composing for them those first two movements, Interlude Two and Epilogue, which would eventually stand as the conclusion of his Shire's Suite. Tippett conducted the premiere at the Cheltenham Festival in 1970. Both movements are underpinned by traditional canons. The anonymous Great Tom is cast in the case of the interlude and William Byrd's Non Nobis Domine in the epilogue. Tippett pointed out that the remarkable virtuosity of the interlude is partly helped by the method of composition. He made a virtue of the fact that he was writing for players with a wide range of abilities. So, for instance, the 30 violins required all have the same part in essence but they have a choice in the complexity of the rhythms. Likewise, the horns have the same single line, but they divide it up according to their ability to produce the necessary notes. So here is the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra. America's interesting. If I know that I'm looking at American scenery, I, I get turned over. There was a marvellous set of T-shirts. They were the first people who seemed to be very drawn. They were students, and they, they came from, from Dallas, Texas, and they came up to Chicago to hear me conduct once. It was a very moving occasion, and they got very keen, and, and they then produced a T-shirt called Turn On to Tippet, which, well, they're OK, this is very American, then why not? Sir Michael Tippett didn't have a first-hand encounter with the landscape, people and T-shirts of the United States until 1965, when he was 60. He'd been invited to be a guest at the summer school and festival in Aspen, Colorado. Tippett fell in love with it, cheesy T-shirts and all, and it was the first of many visits to the country. He was delighted to find that his music was familiar to an enthusiastic audience of young people all over the States through recordings of a number of his works which had been made possible by the British Council and had subsequently found their way to the US campus radio stations, where they'd been played extensively, along with music by many other contemporary British composers. The influence of American music and culture makes itself felt in Tippett's later operas and in his Songs for Dove, a work which was an offshoot of his third opera, The Knot Garden. Songs for Dove is a song cycle with orchestral accompaniment, extrapolating in three scenes, as it were, beyond the boundaries of the opera, the life of one of its characters. Dove is a young musician who happens to be gay, and so can be read, as Tippett himself acknowledged, as a kind of self-portrait. There's also an autobiographical parallel in that in the opera he's in love with a young black man, a writer, 
but the relationship is falling apart, as was Tippett's own with his then long-time partner Carl. In the face of this, Dov's anguished howls open the first two songs. The second song takes us beyond the opera, out into the world on a journey of the imagination, lit obliquely by kaleidoscopic echoes of other journeys, notably by Wagner's Flying Dutchman. It begins by quoting Beethoven's setting of Mignon's song from Goethe's novel Wilhelm Meister, Know You the Land Where the Lemon Trees Flower. But Dov, the traveller, resists the blandishments of the sirens and moves on, and in the third of his songs he journeys full circle west across the snowy Siberian wastes, back to the home without a garden in the big town. He looks in on Dr. Zhivago and his lover, Lara, and finds only a fragment of a love poem, a relic of the transience of love. Dov has to face on his own the struggle of being a poet in a barren land, and of balancing the claims of the life of the city and the eternal values of nature. of Sir Michael Tippett's Songs for Dov. Rather like his creation, Dov, Tippett became a traveller in his later years. As well as spending a lot of time in the USA, he also visited Mexico, Australia and the Far East, and Africa. All his life, Michael Tippett was a bit of a maverick. He was a lifelong humanist and pacifist who stood by his beliefs, even when they were out of step with the rest of society. He was also openly gay at a time when male homosexual acts were criminal in Britain. Yet, despite his outlaw history, he was knighted by the Queen in 1966, made a Companion of Honour in 1979, and then, in 1983, he became one of that extremely select company of only 24 individuals when he was admitted to the Order of Merit. Tippett was an exceptional human being and an exceptional musician. Where so many composers lapse into silence in their later years, he was blessed with an astonishing Indian summer of creativity. The last major orchestral work he completed arose out of a holiday in Senegal in 1990, when he was a sprightly 85-year-old. Tippett himself described what inspired it. We were recommended to visit a small lake known as Le Lac Rose, where at midday the impact of the sun was such as to transform its whitish-green colour to whitish-pink. As things turned out, we reached Le Lac Rose at midday, just in time to see it turn a marvellous translucent pink. The sight of it triggered a profound disturbance within me, the sort of disturbance which told me that the new orchestral work had begun. The Rose Lake, half an hour's worth of music, would take him about two years to complete, Tippett lays the piece out in five main song-like sections, 
He says that he risked identifying these with captions in the score. The lake begins to sing. The lake song is echoed from the sky. The lake is in full song. The lake song leaves the sky, and the lake sings itself to sleep. These titles, he said, give an important dimension to what otherwise might be considered a set of variations. The main sections are separated by short passages which carry only indications of tempo: fast, medium, slow, or calm. Tippett draws on a broad orchestral palette, which includes three flutes, all doubling piccolos, six horns, three trumpets, three trombones, and tuba, and two harps, as well as tuned drums called rototoms. And the sound world he creates matches the exotic location which inspired the music. But he uses this large ensemble sparingly; they hardly ever all play together, and most of the time the ideas are articulated, as Marion Bowen has put it, by a mosaic of contrasting blocks of colour. At the end, Bowen says, Tippett's orchestral mosaic fragments, leaving us with distant drumming, long silences, and a few abrupt chords. Finally, cutting us off from the vision of the lake and its songs, a typical gesture from a composer who felt that inevitably, after the music is finished, we have to come out again into the street. Tibbet continued to travel until the end. In November 1997, while he was attending a celebration of his music in Stockholm, he caught pneumonia. He died of the illness in his London home on the 8th of January 1998, six days after his 93rd birthday.